<laughs> Why don't you each say a quick hello and then we'll dig right in. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I, um, I, I was once on stage when you said the 400 companies with uh, Larry Page from Google and uh, he introduced me and said, uh, and he runs 400 companies, I only run one. And I said, I'll swap. <laughs> <laughs> and Arif, a quick hello. Hi, everybody. I'm a little bit intimidated because I can't see all those people up there. But I know that area is all full. Uh, it's great to be here. And uh, I'm looking forward to a great conversation. Thank you. He's very, very tired. So we're going to see what we can get out of him. They've gone to get him a double espresso from next door. So. We should have started with it that. It comes from living on an airplane. <laughs> All right, very quickly, we all live in awe of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who has spoken from this stage uh, in years past. Richard, in 2008, you appeared with the Archbishop in the Sundance series, Iconoclasts. During the episode, and I watched it carefully, the Archbishop said, an iconoclast is someone who comes along and says, let's just try something new, and that iconoclast generally turns out to be right. Through both of your entrepreneurial careers and humanitarian work, you have both been global leaders in and supporters of trying something new and making something happen. If you could each talk a bit about what drives your ambition to think big and take risks, and from the perspective of your own personal resilience, how have you dealt with the, inevit the inevitable challenges and, frankly, the failures that all entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs face along the way as these are hard jobs that our audience are taking on? Well, I think um, frustration is what often uh, spurs us on. Um, uh, actually, it was 30 years ago this year that I was um, trying to get from Puerto Rico to the British Virgin Islands uh, on, on an, another airline. And, um, <laughs> uh, and uh, the, um, uh, the airline decided that they only had half Full and therefore they bumped us all. And, uh, and I was doubly frustrated because I had a beautiful lady who happens to be in the audience today uh, waiting, waiting for me um, that evening in the British Virgin Islands. So, um, so I went to the back of the airport. Um, I, I was quite a young man, 28 or something. I, I, I uh, hired a plane, um, which I, I could barely afford, but uh, then wrote on a blackboard, Virgin Airlines, which, uh, which I invented there and then, $39 one way to the British Virgin Islands. And I went out amongst all the people in the, in the, who'd been bumped, and I filled my plane. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, and of course, I was no longer frustrated when I got Thank it. Thank you very much. Um, the, um, this is for real. Uh, the, um, but anyway, it got, it got me thinking, and, and that was that airlines do bump people. And, and um, so when I got back to England, I rang Boeing and said, have you got any secondhand 747s for sale? Um, and, the rest, and the rest is history. Um, the, um, so I think, for, yeah, for, frustration uh, um, is what I think spurs us to uh, start businesses. And, and, and if, if thing, other people are not doing it well, you get in there and you um, fill in the gap. And frustration uh, of the tr troubles of the world is what uh, you know, gets us in there to try to um, re resolve the problems of the world or, or do our best. Um, you mentioned Archbishop Tutu. Um, and I, you know, I've been privileged to uh, spend a lot of time with him over, over the years. And, um, and he always mixes uh, this wonderful sense of humor uh, with um, very potent uh, campaigning on issues that he feels strongly about. Um, last month, uh, Uganda, um, in its wisdom, uh, did a, a, a terrible human rights atrocity in saying that uh, gay people um, would have to go to prison for life, and people who didn't report gay people would have to go to prison for life. Um, and Archbishop Tutu, uh, uh, came out with, I think, a, 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 you know, a, a, um, anyway, came out with the, the following statement, and that was, um, when I go to heaven, no, sorry, if I go to heaven, if I'm lucky enough to go to heaven, uh, and I find God is a homophobe, I'm going to ask him to send me to the other place. <laughs> uh, well, uh, uh, humor is important it's as we bad. go through the travails of what we all do. Um, 
and audacious ideas and boldness certainly has taken you far. I like the idea of walking off a plane and starting your own airline. Sounds pretty simple, if only. Uh, Arif, tell me what moves you, inspires you, and how you deal with failure as well as success. I think, you know, you used a good word back then, uh, which was audacity. And I think any halfway decent entrepreneur has got to start by thinking that he can be audacious in the ideas that he wants to propel. And in, in my view, when I look back at the part of the world that I live in, which a lot of you mistakenly call emerging markets, uh, it's a bit patronizing, I call them global growth markets, because most of the world's growth is gonna come from those markets. And I look and see the landscape and the opportunity that we have there to really reshape a very, very crucial part of the world. Because if you think back over the last 50 years, we are living through phenomenal change, turbulent times, and we've had more progress in the last 50 years than we've had in the previous gazillion, right? And when you imagine the fact that along with all of this prosperity, along with all of this development and technological advances, we're also at the same time grappling with extreme poverty, with extreme inequality, and um, extremely difficult living conditions for large segments of the population. So I was fortunate in that I was running a private equity firm which I started. And of course I didn't set off to be the largest private equity firm uh, operating across global growth markets. It happened because we were diligent, we were clear that we wanted to get there. Um, but we didn't focus on that as an outcome. But very, very early on we realized that in order to be successful and in order to grow in that world, you have to be very driven by a very important element called stakeholder engagement. And because of that, from the very first day, we set out saying, this is a big landscape. It's our opportunity to grow within it. And we were very, very focused on ensuring that we were driving value in almost every element of what we were doing. And I think that has been a very crucial part of aiming big and getting it right as well. Tell us a little bit about what stakeholder engagement means to you and how you do it. Sure. So for me, um, you know, the, the whole um, perspective around stakeholder engagement is long-term value creation. Too much of what we do is driven by short-term thinking, short-term gain, immediate in instant gratification. Um, if you don't engage with the stakeholder community in which you're operating, if you do not understand that a company cannot be an island of excellence, in an ocean of turbulence. If you can't work out that in order to succeed going forward in the future, you can't be driving a Range Rover through Soweto without doing something about Soweto as well. So that, at its simplest form, is how we define stakeholder engagement, not only to make money in an environment where it was relatively easier to do so, but then to put back a lot of it into engagement in the community. So one of the things that all of you as social entrepreneurs are very focused on is this whole idea of how ESG can be central to our thinking. From the first day that we started, we put it at the core of our existence. We said, this is not a nice to do, this is not a, you know, it'll be fun to do. It is a core part of our business principles because if you create sustainable businesses, you actually create profitable businesses. And I used to go out and tell people that, you know, success comes before work only in the dictionary. We've got to work, we've got to be really very focused on working hard and we will be successful. And what's the biggest premise of being successful? is to give back. And what I mean by that is I operate in the private equity industry. For far too long, the private equity industry has had a reputation, particularly in the West, of being these alchemists. They stick their hands into this black box. They come out and you know, suddenly base metal is gold. And the longer you keep people in the dark about how we actually go about doing it, the longer we tend to make money. Well, the reality is we're just people that work very hard. We're people that understand our industry. And in our part of the world, if we do it right, and if we take away the myth, if we realize that we're actually on Main Street, not on Wall Street, then we can infect the businesses that we own with the virus of doing things in the right way. And the best example I can give you is one day not very far from now. We're going to be walking into a supermarket, and we're going to be seeing three bottles of water lined up on a shelf. And we'll buy the one from the company that engages most in the communities that it operates in. And that to me is a big win for anyone. So when we talk about stakeholder engagement and the centrality of ESG in our thinking, the most important element of that is that every single one of my colleagues 
takes it as a core component of what they do. We did not create a foundation deliberately. All of us give and give very actively because we want every single person in our company and the 300,000 people that work in our businesses to be infected with that virus and then start giving more and more. Great. Um, uh, Richard, I, I, I've not thought about it as a virus, but you clearly have been infected with that virus as well of businesses doing good. I mean, while we live in a moment, and I, I do think times are changing, sustainability is slowly getting integrated into capital markets, not quickly enough. You're still driven, everybody's driven by short-term returns, by analysts saying, what did you do for me today? By what kind of returns and shareholder value can you show me? Um, you've done, in every one of your businesses, as well as with your efforts around the B team, something near and dear to my heart as I work with an NGO that works with hundreds of companies and investors to integrate environmental social governance into their work. But it's hard, and the pushback is, cr is strong, and Wall Street says, we're only interested in how much money you can make over the next three months or six months. You've somehow said, I'm not living by that standard, and I can succeed at the same time. Tell me a little bit about how you think about that for your companies and your work with the B team. I think um, you know, the chief executive of Apple um, stood up to his shareholders the other day and, um, and said, look, if you, if you don't like the fact that I'm doing things to try to address global warming and it might cost uh, you, the shareholders, a little bit of money, sell your shares and go and invest in another, another company. And I, and I thought that was very refreshing. And we need, I think, more chief executives to stand up to their shareholders and, 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 um, and act in that way. because. Um, you know, what is a company? A company is just a uh, group of people um, who are working together to try to make people's lives better. Um, if your company is not making people's lives better, uh, it won't exist. And, and that applies to most companies, obviously cigarette companies, and, you know, there's a few exceptions to the rule, but generally speaking, that's what, that's what, a, com that's what a company is. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, and I think what the B team are trying to do is to uh, it, um, is to say to uh, people who lead companies all over the world, um, you know, if we can join with governments and the social sector and, um, and uh, all of us become forces for good, every single company in the world become forces for good, little companies become forces for good on local basis, bigger companies on a national basis, bigger companies still on an international basis, adopt problems and use, use our entrepreneurial skills to go out and uh, get on top of these problems, we will get on top of all the problems in the world. I mean, there, there's so many, you know, great entrepreneurial people out there who do great things in, 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 in their own companies who could do incredible things if they think, if they think on a global basis. Um, and the B team is also there just to try to, um, you know, look at issues that we've, where we feel that maybe the business world uh, are letting the world down. So look at you know, corruption in business. Just make sure we, we stamp it out and, and, and uh, it, it doesn't exist anymore. And, and, you know, if we find a businessman who's corrupt, we expose, we expose them. Um, uh, you know, look at subsidies of dirty fuels. Look at subsidies of, uh, you know, of um, fisher, fishermen who are, who, are, you know, who are doing terrible damage to some, some parts of our oceans. Um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, you know, look at the, the workforce and, and our, our people getting a, a, a really fair deal when they go to work and are they being treated with dignity. And, um, and so we've got a wonderful group of people in the B team who, who are, are trying to address some of these issues and hopefully we'll make it, it can make a difference. You know, you're both optimists, you're successful, you're hopeful. Uh, these challenges that we're talking about that Richard just laid out, which are imperatives. Not-for-profits not need to work with businesses to make change to solve some of the world's greatest problems, poverty, education, climate change, water shortages. Uh, but we're not making quite enough progress for everybody to go home this evening and say, I might take a pass next year. Uh, we know the challenges are big. Tell me how you keep your optimism uh, and give us all some advice about how to stay the course over the long run. These problems don't go away easily. Because a lot of the things that we do lead to wins that make us feel good, not just about ourselves, but about the people that we're associated with. The first thing, for example, that we set out in our, all our thinking to all our people is we said, stop thinking of 
the use of the word charity, start thinking of the use of the word philanthropy when you're giving, simply because it, charity implies an unequal relationship between giver and recipient. And, and for us, when we looked at the idea that we could actually, as a business, do extremely well, we're very profitable. Don't get me wrong, guys, we're very profitable. Uh, but in the course of doing so, we realized that we have the ability to deploy some of that and use some of that in very, very important work that is being done. And I think one of the reasons why the world has struggled for a bit is because social engagement and social entrepreneurship in the eyes of hard-nosed business people came out of a fringe element. It came out slightly from left of center, and the word NGO rapidly became associated with slightly soft thinking. It's only now that people are beginning to realize that this short-term pressure on earnings, this ridiculous obsession with creating immediate and instant value does not lead to sustainable companies. Let's not forget that of the Forbes 500 companies in the world today, about half of them are companies that weren't on that list 20 years ago. A lot of the companies that were there a couple of decades ago are non-existent. It's partly due to that short-term obsession as well. And today's successful businesses are the ones that are engaging and engaging actively with realizing that they need to have a responsibility beyond the instantaneous gratification of that stock market blip, 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 blip nonsense. It is, and, and we will get there. Richard, I'm going to go from the sort of nonsense to the true audacious. Um, everybody wonders about Virgin Galactic, uh, particularly we're sitting here at Oxford University. Edwin Hubble graduated from Oxford. Um, you're thinking great thoughts, but you're, you're putting together something that has a vision that many of us could never have imagined. If you take me with you, I'll sing Take Me to the Moon. <laughs> And uh, we got a song coming up. Done. Your wife asked me to offer you a one-way ticket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um. <laughs> Don't worry, not really. <laughs> um, the, uh, yeah, um, it, it's, it's ridiculously exciting. Um, and... Uh, it's, it, it is rocket science, which I've learned. It ta it's taken us longer than, lo longer than we thought to get there. Um, but uh, later this year, I, I, I do believe that we'll, we will have accomplished the first part of our mission, uh, which is to start sending uh, people into space. Um, and when you think that there's only been 540 people uh, sent to space, and that's you know, since space you know, travel began, and, uh, many years ago, and that includes the Russians, the Chinese, and the Americans. Um, uh, uh, and, and then when you think that actually, I think about 80% of the population, if they could afford it, would love to go to space, and if we offer them a return ticket, um, <laughs> they, they, um, uh, the, you know, there is, there's, an enormous, there's an enormous sort of pent-up um, you know, desire to, to uh, travel in space, to look, look back at this beautiful Earth. Um, and what we're hoping is that the, uh, the engine of those people going to space um, uh, will then enable us to do really extraordinarily exciting things. Um, you know, we, there, is, there is three billion people in this world who don't have uh, mobile phones, they don't have internet access, um, they don't have Wi-Fi. Um, if you don't have internet access, it's very difficult to get an education today in some of these places. If you don't have a mobile phone, it's very difficult to start a, a business. Um, so, you know, if you turn the clock forward four, four years, four or five years from now, um, I think that Virgin Galactic will have enabled, um, you know, most of those people to be able to afford to get, um, uh, to get that access. Um, uh, and, uh, and then, you know, uh, we, 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 you know there, there are other very exciting things. I mean, you know, wouldn't it be lovely for somebody who's just done a... Uh, 15 hour plane journey um, uh, and you know to be able to go to Australia um, uh, in 40 minutes and um, and you know if, if we can if we can uh, you know send you uh, orbitally uh, to Australia you'll be traveling at 18,000 miles an hour um, you know we think it's possible to do well, our spaceship is built like an airplane and you know for a reason and it'll get bigger it'll get bigger and it'll get bigger and if we can push it out outside the Earth's atmosphere and back down again, uh, we, we can do it in, 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 an, uh, in an almost completely environmentally friendly way. So, 
Um, so big dreams, some of these dreams will come true, some of them you know, will fall flat on our face, but um, we're, we're going to give it our best shot. Indeed. So that is knowledge and audacity. To my hosts and our hosts, um, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> I, I was told I would have a time clock, and I'm missing it. Do we have time for another question? Do we get a yes? Terrific. Well, uh, I, I would like to listen to these gentlemen for five hours, but we'll take a shot at another question, and I apologize uh, for not noting the time clock. Uh, let me ask this question. Arif, in a recent survey, you said you wish to be a fly on the wall in 50 to 75 years from now. Uh, because the world would look dramatically different from our world looks today. For both of you, what is the world going to look like? What is your ambition for the world to look like? What are we leaving for our younger generations and generations yet to come? And what advice can you give to the audacious people in this crowd, a thousand strong and many more, for how each of us can help shape the world so when you're looking at it 75 years from now, you're feeling like you're ready to give a high five rather than worrying about your children and your grandchildren? Phew, that was a long question. I forgot what you were asking. <laughs> I, I'm kidding. You know, one of the most exciting things about sitting on this platform with, with Richard is I remember, I actually remember, like, when I was a young kid of 9 or 10, watching man walk on the moon for the first time. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, how privileged am I to be watching this? And then I said, you know, X number of years later, 40 years later, listening to him talking about sending commercial people into space and knowing the reality that a little cell phone in today's world has more power than that instrument that landed man on the moon back then. It has enabled us to dream. So when I talk about technical innovation and when I think about the way that the world has speedily moved on, it was in that context that I said I wish I was a fly on the wall 75 years from now, because I know I'm not going to be there. That's the world that we're leaving to our children. But in the context of leaving it to our children, I think that our generation has done some very good things. It's changed the world in very positive ways. It's also done some very bad things. And part of the bad things, for example, is we have, generally speaking, entered a trend where we are in the context of breaking a promise. There are more unemployed graduates in the world today than they have ever been in the history of the world. And these are people that we send to college saying, go and you will be better than us, but the jobs aren't there. We haven't created the enabling environment for these kids to have a viable future. But for me, the opportunities that this world is throwing up through technological innovation, through mental stimulation, through the way in which we're moving forward as rapidly as we are, tells me that we are actually today in a watershed moment. The fact that we had a global financial crisis in 2008, and we never punished anyone for it, but that's another story altogether. Um, but the reality is that that was a great moment, actually, because it forced us to stop and think what was wrong with the system. Over time, we'll fix that, too. This watershed moment is going to enable us to take a quantum leap forward. For example, 75 years ago, there were only 70 countries in the world. Today, there are 200. And yet we consider that the entire world's map as we see it today is cast in stone. Well, countries are a product of merely the last 100 years of colonial evolution. The real reality is the cities. The cities that have been centers of urban civilization. Damascus is a city that has been there for a few thousand years, whether or not Syria continues to be the same or not. The same with Cairo, the same with London, and so on. So I think we're too focused right now on national boundaries. We should be much more focused on the commonality of what each of us can do for ourselves and for each other. Globalization has had some massive positive impact, but we haven't yet begun to harness the power of it. And I think that we have this divide called North and South, unfortunately, more pronounced than it's ever been. We have a lot of people wanting to do good in the global growth markets, in Africa, in Latin America, and so on, but are not finding the channels to be able to do so. I think if we all come together, then the world that I'll be viewing 75 years from now is going to be a spectacularly good one. Terrific. Richard, take us into the next 75 years. You don't have to talk anymore. Hey. <laughs> um, I'm, an, I'm a real optimist, and I think if, you know, if, if the social workers in this room uh, can work with the, uh, the business world um, and, and with politicians, um, 
and we, and we can just ra rally together. Um, I think we can get on top, as I said, of most, most of the problems in the world. Um, and, and, you know, if you go forward 50 years, uh, I think there will be two billion less people uh, than there are today. And, and the reason I think that is um, that as people are lifted out of poverty, um, uh, they have less children, uh, and they're, they're apt to move to cities where, again, they have less children. Um, and, and I think, you know, if you look at the last few decades, the amount of people coming out of poverty is, 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 is moving forward in a, in a really dramatically positive way. Um, but I think there are things we've got to do urgently uh, in the short term, uh, because it would be too sad in 50 years' time uh, if we don't have any sharks, if we don't have any lemurs, um, if we don't have any rhinos, if we don't have any elephants, etc. So um, there, 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 are, there are immediate challenges where, which we've just got to uh, get on top of and, and um, campaign to stop uh, uh, the sort of atrocities that are going on with our species around the world. Um, and, um, uh, you know, 50 years from now, um, I mean, we, we just, it's just unbelievable that a Syrian crisis can have been allowed to get out of control in the way this one has. Um, it, it, you know, it's just got to be a thing of the past. And um, hopefully the elders by then will have uh, resolved all conflicts um, and um, we'll, we'll cross our fingers. Amen to that. Thank you. Well, <laughs> that is inspiring. I think for each of us who works hard every day, uh, listening to these stories, knowing it can be done, uh, having you out there as visionaries and guiding lights, for all of us, our heartfelt thanks, and let's give you, Thank you. a round of Thank applause. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.